Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, where we explore the historical reliability and truthfulness of the Bible. I'm your host, Henry Smith. Today we have a fan favorite back on the show, archaeologist and ABR staff member, Dr. Scott Stripling. Scott, welcome back to Digging for Truth. Hey, I've been looking forward to being with you, Henry. All right, Scott. Well, we want to we're going to go on an archaeological journey through the book of Judges. About 350 years of history, a lot of time passes in the book of Judges. And uh, we want to do some archaeology and Judges, Scott. Looking forward to doing this with you. So we're going to parachute right in at the beginning of the Judges period. Uh, let's talk about the first judge and um, some interesting archaeological evidence related to him. Okay, well, here we go. This guy's name is Othniel. And what's most interesting is that Judges 3, 7 through 11, by the way, he's also mentioned uh, in the book of Joshua. He's quite heroic. Um, but he is one generation past uh, Joshua and Caleb. So we can be very concrete in, in placing him at the beginning of the Judges period. Now, interestingly, in this Judges passage, if I can read a few verses from it, Judges 3, 7 to 11, it says the Israelites fell into sin. Then verse eight, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Kushan Rishathaim, king of Aram Naharim. Now, Henry, those are the type of names that, you know, sometimes we just read right over. Yes, I, yes. You know, uh, it doesn't make any sense or who was that, but we actually do know who that was. This is northwest Mesopotamia. So Nahar in Hebrew with the I am ending, that would be, you know, between the rivers. In other words, it's translated in most English translations as Mesopotamia or northwest uh, Mesopotamia. And the text says the Israelites were subject to him for eight years, but when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up a deliverer, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. The spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. And the Lord gave Kushan Rishathaim, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel. So this is very, very interesting, Henry, because this, this land of uh, Aram Naharim is referring to none other than the Matani kingdom. Now, I'm, I've written an article about this that'll, that'll be coming out soon with all the details. But for now, I don't think there's any, any reason to dispute the fact that this land between the rivers, Aram Naharim, is referring to the Matani. And this is a powerful kingdom in the late Bronze Age. They collapse around the year 1350. So if Othniel is conquering the king of the Mitanni, then it would have to be before 1350. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense from a chronological standpoint. If you, if you date the je death of Joshua, say 1370, 1375, that's probably a reasonable date for that. We don't know exactly. Uh, what I hear you saying is if, uh, now someone else destroyed the Mitanni kingdom, not the Israelites, right? As first, just to be clear about that. That, that's right, the Hittites. But we could also, I think, read into this and plausibly see that Othniel may have played a role in the weakening of the Mitanni kingdom, which was then ultimately conquered by the Hittites. Okay. So um, what, what would be the implications for this for dating the Exodus and the conquest? Scott, flesh that out a little bit. Uh, for those familiar with that, I'm sure they're picking up on the consequences, but you tell us what you think. Well, let's say somebody is taking a late date or a 13th century uh, date for the Exodus, then you've got a real problem if your first judge is encountering these uh, people in the Aram Nacharim. So the Arameans, of course, descend, you know, it's talking about Aram. Um, I looked at the Archaeological Study Bible, the ESV Archaeological Study Bible, to see what they said, because they take a, a late date. And they said, well, this may be a memory of Abraham's encounter with Keto Lamor and the, the Mesopotamian kings that was, you know, down in you know, south in the Dead Sea region or something like that. Maybe that's why Othniel was encountering him. I thought, wow, that's really stretching it out because <laughs> it's giving a specific name of a specific king here. And, and the uh, etymology of that word, the, the between the rivers, we know this is North Mes Mesopotamia. And there's nothing in the text that indicates anything about Abraham. I mean, that that just seems totally yeah. foreign, foreign to the context, right? Am I right? Am but I understanding is, that right? If we could use chess terminology, when you get 
when you're in check, you have to make a radical move on the board because <laughs> you're in big trouble. And what else are they going to say? I mean, the, the plain reading of the text is that Israel's first judge conquered the Matani, or at least in a battle, won a, a battle and you know fought off the Matani um, for a period of time. If it's indeed true what the text says, that places it pre-1350. Yeah, yeah, that's very good. That's very good. And, and again, we're we're saying this is this, this is the Israel's first judge in the post Joshua era. So, and he's he's a bridge really because he's related to Caleb. It's really really fascinating. And people, I know because I've done it too. When I say people, we skip over some of these names because yeah. they make they make our eyes gloss. But the writers of Scripture are are very specific about this. So, all right, that's excellent, Scott. Would you like to add anything else about that? Or shall we move on to the famous James Bond scene with Ehud and Eglon? Would you like to do that? <laughs> well, I tell you, well, now that we've got our chronology straight and, and we're looking in the right time period, now let's talk about the right stuff. All right. So I did mention here this incredibly gruesome and uh, fascinating and interesting episode with Ehud and Eglon. Um, Give us some insights about some archaeology related to that, because, again, this goes back to the question of dating and synchronizing and all that kind of thing. Okay. Well, I thought you were going to ask me to talk about a fitness program we could have got Eglon on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's kind of a humorous story, but, you know, it's a gruesome, gruesome ending that, uh, that he experiences at the hands of uh, Ehud. Um, Garstang's excavation in the 1930s at Jericho, he uncovered um, what he believed was sort of the post-conquest uh, uh, occupation of Jericho. He uncovered what is normally referred to as the middle building. And um, that middle building dates to the the LB2 period. So um, there were a number of things found around that building that make it datable, including a cuneiform tablet from the 14th century, probably indicating that there are a lot more there still waiting uh, to be found. Uh, Cypriot pottery, local painted pottery, um, an earthen oven that was found around there too. So if we're looking for an occupation post-Joshua, at Jericho, I think we clearly have evidence of that in in Garstang's middle building. All right, very good. Well, Scott, we're going to take a break, and then we're going to pick up more on that after a brief message. We'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith, your host. I'm here with archaeologist Dr. Scott Stripling. We're going on an archaeological journey through the Book of Judges. Okay, Scott, so you mentioned the middle building that was discovered, uh, that was identified as Eglon's Palace. Uh, just a couple more exploratory questions with that before we move on. This, Kine sure. this cuneiform tablet, tell us just a little more about it and what the implications are. If, if, if there's one tablet mm. found, what's the inference from the experience of archaeology with that? Okay, if, if there's a tablet found, just like in Hatsur, fragments of cuneiform tablets have been found there. The archive has never been found. Normally, the archives are in the gate area of the city. So just like at Hotsore, they're very interested in finding where, the, where those cuneiform fragments coming from. Same thing, um, same thing at Jericho. And um, Negro has, has quite a bit to say about this. So from photos from this cuneiform tablet, which I just looked at yesterday, and it's pretty badly damaged, but you can see you know, that it's cuneiform, and it's from that uh, middle building. So, you know, if, if indeed that's LB2, then, then the tablet is 2, which puts it in the Amarna horizon. Now, I know we're going to probably talk about the Amarna tablets in a few minutes, but uh, that, that's what's interesting. So uh, none of the Amarna tablets that we have say anything about Jericho, which sort of leaves you scratching your head. And so perhaps we're going to find something new um, in continued excavations at Jericho, which will help us understand what indeed Jericho was doing in that the 14th century BC, what we would call the Amarna period. 
Oh, very good. That's very good, Scott. And we encourage people to go read that narrative, you know, just to see see that. In fact, I did a paper when I was in seminary. I found a scholar named Baruch Halpern who drew sure. drew a picture of what he thought the building looked like based on the biblical text. And when you compare it to Garstang's excavation drawings, they're actually very similar. And it looks like Halpern knew nothing about the archaeology. So that it's a really fascinating mm. thing that he got he got it out of the text. But we, we can't stay there unless you want to add some more to that, Scott. Did you want to add well, more? Well, I'll br briefly say for people who have been to Jericho, if they're trying to picture where this middle, middle building was, um, when you park in the parking lot and enter the, the site as you would today, and you immediately go up that hill, that's what's called Spring Hill. And so then kind of down from that would be where the ancient spring of Jericho is. So you walk into Jericho today and you go straight up the hill. You're up on top of Spring Hill, and that's where the middle building is. Cool stuff. So we had Garstang, who found it originally, Kenyon, who did some follow-up work, and now uh, Lorenzo Negro, who's doing the work there now, all agree this building is from the time period that we would say fits the biblical text. Yeah, and you know we're sort of waiting with bated breath because Negro has excavated quite a bit, and he's published quite a bit, except in the late Bronze Age. So we have his publications from the early Bronze, from Calcolithic, early Bronze Age, Middle Bronze Age, and and we're just waiting for uh, the late Bronze Age stuff because I think he has some new things that are going to shed light on this as well. He even believes that there is a late Bronze Age wall built at this time, a, a mud brick wall on top of the old stone revetment wall that dates to that time period. All right. Well, it all seems to fit nicely with the Bible. And of course, one of the things you do as an archaeologist is not only our own dig and our own research, but you monitor what's going on in these other excavations. And when we find out more, our friends here watching Digger for Truthful, yeah. hear, hear right from you, Scott. Okay. <laughs> so, so we talked about this cuneiform tablet and you mentioned, and we both mentioned the Amarna letters. Now this, mm -hmm. we've done an episode, two episodes, you and I, but let's give us a, a, a nice tutorial on the Amarna letters and how they fit into the judges' period. Well, Akkadian is the diplomatic writing of, of the ancient world, and we have a lot of writing. So we have tablets from, from Ugarid, from Ebla, various places. So whatever their language might be, the script that was being used is this Akkadian cuneiform type script. Uh, what we refer to as the Amarna letters, because they came from Tel El Amarna, when, when Amenhotep IV or Akhenaten built his new capital, being a monotheist, he moved down south a bit, built this new capital, and uh, 382 tablets emerged from there, and it, they are a series of correspondence between Pharaoh uh, primarily Amenhotep the third and fourth, but a few from outliers. And these Canaanite city-states, client kings of Egypt, if you will, they're crying out for help because they're being overrun by the Abiru, the Habiru. Uh, and this happens to synchronize or coincide with the time of Joshua's conquest. And so what we're most interested in exploring is, is this indeed a synchronism? Are the Habiru none other than the biblical Hebrews? Excellent, excellent. And we should we should mention we can mention many things about the Amarna letters. One is uh, it shows the accurate description of the political structure of Canaan in the book of Joshua. As Joshua yeah. describes it, as as is the structure in Canaan, which shows that Joshua is a contemporary eyewitness account. And yeah, and a couple of other things, like the, the Canaanite uh, peasants, they are going over to the Israelites. We see that in the Bible. When Joshua is attacking cities, the majority of the population doesn't live in the cities. The population lives outside the, the city walls. It's the kings who live inside the city. So the, the peasants ally themselves with Joshua. They do the same thing in the Amarna letters. Uh, so there's a number of, of, of reasons that we believe that you're looking at a synchronism there. Um, and, and we have a new article coming out on that soon. All right, Scott. So for that article, we are going to talk about, uh, I want you to give a little information about that, but we're going to save that for our next episode because we're, we're doing two together. Uh, yep. Give us just a little bit, a little taste about what you found in this original research that you're doing uh, related to Shiloh. Well, I had often said, in fact, I'm sure in writing and maybe on this program, I had said, you know, there's nothing but the Bible that mentions Shiloh. So, you know, we need to take the Bible seriously, take it at face value, because we do not have any ancient source that mentions Shiloh. And as I was reading through the Amarna letters, particularly those of Abdihiba, the king of Jerusalem, like 285 to 291, 
Um, I was shocked in 288 when I saw where he's talking in a context of these these uh, Canaanite sites in the highlands like Lachish, for example, and there is a Silu that is mentioned there, and that caught my attention, and uh, that's what led me down this rabbit hole of research that we're going to talk about. All right. Well, we're looking forward to that. So we hope folks come for that back for that second episode when Dr. Stripling exposits that for us. But right now we're going to go to a break, and we're going to pick up on the other side with Dr. Scott Stripling. We'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. It's a journey through judges, through the world of archaeology, and we're here with uh, archaeologist Dr. Scott Stripling. All right, my friend. Well, we just uh, talked about the Amarna letters a little bit and how they fit into the context of uh, the book of uh, uh, Judges, the early Judges period. Um, let's talk a little bit about what we know in the history of, of Egypt's relationship with Canaan, right? Because we just talked about the Amarna letters, we have the Israelites going into the land, but there's some nuance there with the relationship with Egypt. Would you exposit that and spell that out for our viewers? Tutmosis the third is the most powerful of all the pharaohs. So you're talking 18th dynasty, New Kingdom period. <clears throat> In about 1479, he conquers Canaan. He erected victory stellas all over the place. So nobody disagrees with the fact that he conquered Canaan about 1479. It came under Egyptian hegemony at that time. It remained under Egyptian hegemony during the time of the Exodus and during the time of the conquest. Imagine the American colonies were, you know, belonged to Great Britain, but they were they were starting to pull away before before the American Revolution. There were tensions. That's exactly the geopolitical situation in Canaan at the time that Joshua arrives. And so Israelites arrive. These we know from the Amarna letters that they're paying tribute to Egypt. They send their sons, their daughters, even their wives sometimes are required to go to, to Egypt and they're held hostage there so that if they revolt, then their families are going to be killed. And then they train their sons and send them back. So we, we should not think of these, Henry, as Canaanite city-states. These are Egyptian city-states in Canaan. These are their colonies. Yeah, it's, re it's really fascinating. There's a, there's a complex relationship going on there. Now, tell us a little bit about what we know about kind of generally where the Egyptians still held control going into the judges and where the Israelites were and kind of like how that relationship worked as far as we know. Well, if, if the Amarna letters are indeed synchronizing with, with the conquest account, it's in transition. So there, it's in the middle of changing hands. At Lachish, so we have Labayu, the king of Shechem. Uh, I said Lachish, I should have said Shechem. Uh, Labayu, the king of Shechem, <clears throat> he's already confederated with the Habiru. So if that's the Hebrews, you're looking at a direct synchronization with the conquest account. And all of his sons have gone over and have confederated. And only the king of Jerusalem, Abdiheba, says everyone else has fallen in the hill country. And I'm, I alone am loyal. And you better send soldiers to guard me or to come and get me out of here. I'm going to be dead soon. And no one's going to be paying tribute uh, to you this year. So they're really giving us a picture of the transition from Egyptian rule to early Israelite rule, which in a sense, you know, we talk about the, the judges period is a con time of confederation, decentralized government. But as long as Joshua was alive and maybe Caleb was alive, you have executive, clear executive leadership. I mean, everyone, he's not a king, but clearly he's in charge. But after the death of Joshua and Caleb, then you enter into this, this confederacy period where God raises up leaders from time to time. Yeah, it's very good. So, And some of that complexity is not described exactly in the Bible, like the Egyptian presence really doesn't show up in Scripture, but there's a bigger backdrop, and that's fine. The Bible only records what God wanted, and we 
the wonderful thing about archaeology is we can fill in we can fill in all the blanks as right. it were, right? You know. Well, like we just did with Kushan Rishafaim. I mean, right there in the Book of Judges, we can say, well, the Matani's not mentioned. The, the the geopolitical powers, and these guys, incidentally, are powerful. They're referred to in the Amarna letters too, and they even get to call Pharaoh by his name. And so these these Canaanite rulers, I mean, they they never get to refer to him by his name. Um, so there's there's more in the text, I think, the deeper we dig. Very good, very good. Okay, so Scott, um, uh, let's spend our last time here together in this in this show talking about one of our favorite subjects, and that is Pharaoh Merneptah. Uh, maybe somebody hearing for the first time, who who is this guy? What do we know about him, and how does he fit into our conversation? Well, if Ramesses the third was the most powerful of all the pharaohs, that's 18th dynasty, the second most powerful would have been Ramesses the second, and that's on the 19th dynasty. His son, Merenepta, is the one we're talking about in the Merenepta Stella. So he writes in this Stella about the people that he has conquered, and he writes in sort of a geographic direction also. So he's mentioning these places as if one is moving from the south to the north, and he refers to Israel. And so uh, many people have said that this is the earliest mention of Israel in a text outside the Bible. That's indeed not the case. We, we do have uh, earlier mentions than that. But this dates to about 1210 BC, and no one disputes that it's Israel. So let's just take it as if it were the earliest for a moment. That means that he, he says he's conquered them. In fact, uh, it's hyperbole. Um, Israel is conquered. His seed is no more. Um, so that means they're an established people group in Canaan by 1210, and now they've been conquered. Well, you can see the problem with the, the late date or 13th century date for the Exodus is, is that if they're arriving around you know, uh, we're exiting around 1250, arriving around 1210. <laughs> well, how are you conquering them around 1210 if they've just arrived? Yeah, they, they, they would have barely settled. Uh, I mean, they wouldn't even have had a chance to even settle into the cities. They probably still would be sort of quasi nomadic at that point. I mean, you know, it just doesn't seem to work very well, does it? Yeah, because he's, he's recognizing them as an established people group along with the others that he has conquered. And the, just the timing is very problematic for the late date adherents. Yeah, and for, for the perspective we believe is, is it would have been two centuries. It would have been a lot of time for the Israelites to get established and to be enough to be mentioned on the stela. Now, I wanted to ask too, Scott, we didn't, we didn't plan to do this, but uh, you know your stuff so well, so I'm not worried about asking you this question. We see the destruction of Hatsur during the time of the judges, and you've made a suggestion about Merneptah that might be related yeah. to that. Uh, share that with the audience. Well, we have two destruction levels at, <clears throat> at Hatsur. And what's interesting is it, you, you have one dating to the 15th century, one dating to the 13th century. We have tried to understand that. Well, the 15th century one is sort of in that LB1B, LB2A horizon. It's probably Joshua's conquest of Jericho because the Bible says that he burned Hatsur. Then to whom do we attribute the 13th century uh, level, and we've we've thought in the past maybe Deborah, um, you know, has conquered Deborah and Barak have conquered Hot Sword, and that may may be the case. But also we have Merneptha in the Merneptha Stella claiming to have conquered all of these sites at that time, to have marched through Canaan, and recently Gezer, for example, there's no doubt that it was conquered by the Egyptians under Merenepta at that time. So he's claiming credit for it at the time that, that the Bible says that it happened. So I'm inclined to give him, give him credit. I think it probably was Merenepta. Yeah, and, and since the biblical text does not explicitly say that Deborah and Barak destroyed Hatsor, this is, this is a theoretical possibility that I think I think we should explore. Okay, Scott, well, guess what? We're going to move to our next episode, and you're going right. to and you're going to share this original research about Shiloh and its relationship to the Amarna letters. We're looking forward to it. So, Scott, thanks for thanks for all you do, and we'll be right back with you for part two. All right, brother. Okay, we're also going to talk about some some weird gods from other cultures. Well, that sounds great. So that's a great way for, to, to let people know. Come back and hear about <laughs> hear about weird gods. We have them in our modern culture too, Scott. <laughs> so, all right. Well, friends, thank you for joining us uh, for Digging for Truth. Uh, you know our message for those of, who have watched before that we can trust the Bible and we see that in the archaeological record. Please come back with Dr. Stripling so we can explore that further in the Book of Judges. And thank you for supporting the ministry.
Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV. Positively different.